Thank you. Thank you to all the panelists. Thank you, Dharithi, ma'am, for bringing us back on track uh, and for facilitating this conversation. Uh, that brings us to the last panel discussion uh, for the day, uh, centered around creating pathways for women through education and skilling. Um, I request all the panelists, um, Dr. Sandhya Purecha, Dr. Rijita Kulkarni, Dr. Gayatri Vasudevan, Dr. Linda uh, Laura Sabadini, and uh, Ms. Senya Shits Sorry, Shevtsosa? Shevtsova. Um, to please take their seats at the dais. This session will be uh, moderated by uh, W20 Task Force Chair, Ms. Cheryl Miller. All right. Uh, and I also request uh, Professor Shamika Ravi to join us on stage to deliver uh, the introductory address. Professor Shamika Ravi delivering the introductory address. Namaskar. Sorry, I was missing an action for one minute. <laughs> Sometimes the most important conversations happen informally. I just met uh, an incredible bunch of youngsters trying some wonderful uh, things, including in uh, areas of incubation of new age businesses. Um, and I'm a business school professor. For me, that is always very, very exciting, uh, particularly in cities like Aurangabad. I mean, this is traditionally, we, th we think of this as a tier two, tier three city. But that's only, that reflects our lack of understanding and the perspective we have from Delhi and Mumbai. There's a lot of action uh, in smaller cities of India. So first of all, thank you for uh, this honor. Uh, it's very nice to be here amongst you. I want to have a little bit of a difficult conversation. I'm going to call it a difficult dialogue, simply because as a platform, it's not it's not just the good things and things we agree upon that we should be talking. There are some conversations, I think the time is right also from uh, the fact that we have all collectively emerged out of COVID. Uh, and some of the outcomes that relate to women, uh, this is that platform where we should at least begin to think about uh, these tensions that are emerging. You know, COVID made one thing very clear. This is the first time we are seeing in the most developed parts of the world Many elderly die alone without family. In fact, I encourage you to pick up a book by uh, the Nobel laureate Angus Deaton, my guru, who wrote a book called The Deaths of Despair. And this was, of course, pre-COVID, but COVID has only exaggerated. It has exacerbated the problem of the breakdown of the family structure. And one thing that is very closely linked with the breakdown of the family structure is also a major rise in women's labor force participation. When women go out and work, and work in the marketplace, meaning this is a marketable activity, we attribute more value to that activity. We are discounting a very large part of the economic activity, which is called the care economy. Caring is, of course, children and motherhood. I completely agree with uh, Farah. It's an excellent presentation she made. But in India, we are working towards developing a national strategy for the care economy. We have more than 100 million people above the age of 60. We are a young economy, but we are a fast growing and we will age very fast when we start aging. So we have to start preparing. We also have to learn from uh, the experiences of other major economies such as China. China is a middle income country today, but the kind of demographic shifts it has seen 
works as a bit of a caution. We would be very worried about growing old before we become rich. We have a long way to go. We still have a per capita income of $2,200 per capita per year. So there is enormous amount of growth ahead of us. And demographic, people grow nations. And if people grow nations, we have to consider the institutions like family at the heart of a lot of that economic growth. We have to preserve family. What am I coming towards? <clears throat> I'm coming towards the notion that only marketable activities are valuable in the society today. On an average, a working age woman in India from the age of 18 to 59, on an average spends seven hours a day taking care of someone in the family. A working age girl, woman, spending seven hours. But what about working women of working age, meaning they are necessarily going out and doing some marketable activity, even they are spending on an average four hours per day taking care of someone in the family. Care is of great value to society and in the family. We have to stop discounting it. And if we discount it, and we, I mean us, this is the coalition of the willing. If we discount it, society and economy at first will discount it because market associates value based on transactions. So we have to get creative about it. Now, as an economist, let me tell you, there is a very quick, easy fix statistically. But that is just a statistical solution, meaning in agriculture, we procure a lot of grains from farmers, the government procures. We set a minimum support price, which is based on the cost of agriculture. And that cost incorporates labor, which also incorporates home labor, right? How much of, how many hours of time is being spent by the family on cultivation? So we are able to attribute a value. So statistically, it is not a big problem where we can attribute a shadow price. And we know what is the value, therefore, being generated by women within the household and what percentage of the GDP is on account of that. But that is still only a statistical fix. That's like yet another study. We have seen studies from the IMF. We have seen studies from uh, the global, the McKinsey uh, Global Institute. We are seeing studies of this form. We have to now get to the institutions that are going to provide the solutions. One of the reasons why India's labor force participation is not rising at the level we would like it to. We are the only country where labor force participation has not kept pace with economic growth. Unlike other traditional societies like Japan, China, Korea, elsewhere, is because one of the reasons is that we are seeing a very rapid degree of urbanization. We are seeing a very rapid degree of nuclearization of families, meaning you know, two, three generations are not living together anymore. We are very quickly moving away from that, which is the borrowed knowledge that, you know, what we have seen in most of the OECD countries. Modernization means breakdown of the family structure. And we have to question that premise right at the beginning, that modernization must go hand in hand with not just nurturing, but active encouragement of the family structure which means giving a value to care economy, giving value to the care that women provide. One of the reasons why labor force participation becomes a real tension, and again, let me tell you, I teach in business programs which are some of the most expensive, meaning students are taking big debt to come and study and get their MBA degree. 40% of my students are women, and yet by the time they hit 30, most of the women are struggling because who's going to take care of the children? So this is not a problem related to either one rung of the economic spectrum or the other. We are all collectively struggling as women because we are caregivers. That is what nature ordained. So to fight that and deny it and just think of it as a non-marketable activity, I think is a very, very big disservice we do to our society uh, uh, and large. So what is the solution? Well, solution is we have to share. Meaning the cost of bearing and rearing children and the cost of taking care of the elderly cannot be disproportionately only done by women. 
we have to design and we have to get our institutions and by institutions of course government policy is one part of that institution second is industrial policy within industrial policy labor policy the third is society at large and by that i mean we need religious leaders we need community leaders we need the civil society to basically rise and think of what are we going to do to lesser this burden or this cost of care away from the women so that it's not entirely borne by the women so i'm here just to make a pitch that look education skilling and entrepreneurship we are making huge strides in this country we are seeing 93% enrollment rate we are seeing girls do phenomenally well in 10th grade 12th grade they always outperform the boys but when it comes to labor market participation when it comes to jobs when it comes to earning money then the real tension you know that's when the cows come home or the chickens come home what are you going to do we need to design institutions that take care of this a very small uh, point that i also want to uh, make regarding entrepreneurship and working of women as business uh, business leaders or business women you know we really need to make a push for financial literacy one of amongst all the different things we have been and i've been listening to everyone since the morning one of the biggest constraints we face today is not finance in fact in india and in most emerging markets we have the finance we have the capital we also have the requisite financial institutions catering and targeting on this kind of market segment the problem is we are not providing enough financial literacy meaning cash flow management meaning how do you file claims when you are insured women have the insurance but they are not filing claims this is all very well established in the literature so again constraint is not necessarily finance we need to seriously think of educating and financial literacy and make it mainstream part of education uh, policies across the world so care economy financial literacy those are my big takeaways i wish you all a wonderful stay in aurangabad and i hope you also get to see a little bit of this magnificent very diverse large country of ours thank you very much now time for the panel thank you so much for that intervention um my name is Cheryl Miller i'm a member of the European the EU delegation to the W20 since about uh, 2018 i want to keep my opening remarks brief but first of course to express our condolences to the victims of the uh, situation in calabria this morning and to a call for action um to support migrant people everywhere as we know that disproportionately impacts girls and women also to condemn in the harshest terms the invasion of ukraine by russia um ukraine being our sister european country and this situation is simply not tenable um then to say to thank you to our g20 and w20 and aurangabad maharashtra hosts thank you very much i'm i feel very honored to be wearing a traditional sari from this region and wanted to launch our panel with some words of a maharashtrian feminist educator who i'm sure you are with whom i'm sure you are familiar does that can anyone guess her name is Savitri Bai Pune yes who says be self reliant be industrious work gather wisdom and riches all gets lost without knowledge we become animal without wisdom sit idle no more go get education so this is our call to action today i'm really honored to be facilitating this discussion and as i said in our preparatory notes all of these incredible women wear many hats as you know and as you all do so my question to them was with this particular question of education and skilling women which is urgent around the world to please tell me why this topic 
is important to you while making your introductory comments about yourself. Shall we start all the way from the left to the right this time? Hi, I'm Gayatri Vasudevan. Uh, I run a social enterprise called NetNet, and when, when you asked the question, I was thinking, why is it important? Uh, as you rightly said, women's representation in education is going up in India, but women's representation in work has been static or going down. And I think that's the reason why this topic is exceedingly important. And I will just end by saying that in my opinion, that's also because uh, uh, the ownership of assets which women are operating is not in their names. So how do we change that? And they are also not partaking of the new economy surge that is happening. For example, the logistics surge, the digital surge, women are not participating in it. And I think those are the changes India requires. Hello, <laughs> thank you. Uh, my name is Ksenia Shevtsova, I'm from Russia, and uh, this topic is important for me uh, because first of all, I work in the higher education sector, and secondly, because 80% of uh, Russian women involved in educational sector, and uh, most of them study pedagogical sciences, and still there is a small uh, proportion of uh, finance is going to support women researchers. Like in Russia, we have many programs supporting uh, young researchers, for example, but uh, we don't have uh, specifically female focused um, programs. And that could be uh, one of the recommendations further. Also, I worked for the Russian uh, Women's Union and um, for two universities in Russia. And I think this. Uh, issue is very important for India, where um, is the highest population in the world, and uh, is the second nation uh, in the world uh, with the highest population of women. I'm Rajita Kulkarni. I'm the president of Shishi University. Uh, Shamika ji, thank you for those introductory remarks. Uh, and at a later stage, I want to tell the story of my mother, which talks to the point you made about really striking the balance between giving care and or choosing a profession for yourself. Uh, and for me, this topic is very important for a number of reasons. Uh, being in the space of higher education, I am again seeing how, as you said, so many of our toppers are girls. Our toppers at undergrad levels are girls, postgrad levels are girls. So many of the post uh, doctoral program students are girls. Uh, Sandhya Tai runs our uh, doctoral program in Bharatnatyam research. Maximum students, uh, researchers are women. But what happens is as women reach 30s or mid 40s, if I look at my own LinkedIn profile, so many of my bright school and college mates today are not in active professional um, roles, not because they are not capable, but because they are not able to. And um, there is actually now research which shows that with the advancement of health sciences, our lifespans are going to expand so much that each of us will land up having about six different or distinct careers. And if we were to, like I am on my second career, I was a uh, financial uh, in the financial world banking in my previous career and now in education so if we have to respond to this reality of our world we need to upskill ourselves and secondly in the context of india per se being today the most populous country in the world the participation on women in the workforce which is linked to the skills we have as of what is needed now is directly linked to the development, sustainable development of our economy. And if we were to become the, the top third economy of the world, then that has an impact on the global growth levels. So I think uh, it is a foregone conclusion that we need to do this. How to do this 
in the most optimum way is really the challenge. So that's that's my opening thoughts. Namaste, you asked for why the education has to be taught. In India, the values and norms are taught through the uh, through the education and women is yeah. why it is important to me because it's the uh, education through which the women are going to empower their own family their children and be besides that not only family and children it's also the society if the one women educated is the whole society they can educate so i feel it is not just you are educating one woman you are educating the nation the whole edu nation will be educated if really really you educate the uh, women that's what my point is now what about what shamika ji said about us hitting the glass ceiling, of course, because it is a global phenomenon. When girls and women are educated, they are the highest achievers, fact. Um, we are not always given the opportunity to become educated. And then with that degree, what are we able to accomplish? So that is the next challenge. Um, I would now like to ask more about Specifically, maybe we can start from, from you now, given the context. Um, what, is the, what are the challenges that you've seen going from the university into the workforce that you think there are lessons that we could be learning and taking away to the next discussion? This is a very, very important question. And I think the challenges are different, uh, what I see as for us in the urban world versus in the rural world. Uh, let's talk about the urban context first, which maybe most of us come from. So in the urban context, as I was saying before, uh, what happens for us as women is that our biological clock and our professional clock are going exactly in opposite directions. So as we reach our 30s, and we want to build our careers, that's where our biological clock has started ticking the, you know, in a much fast paced way. I call this the double whammy years, and I've spoken a lot about it. So for women, what happens is that the years between, somewhere between the 30s to the early 50s, first you get busy with uh, tending for childcare, bringing up family, Shamika was talking about it. But I think in all, with all due respect, who is not? Who is familiar with this story? Are you are you afraid? Are you shy to raise your hands? Because <laughs> I think we all recognize the pattern. My question is, how do we fix it? So knowing that this is the reality, what are the pain points to address? Okay, so there is there are no easy solutions to it. Number one, I think. Many of us who are sitting here are leaders of our own institutions. And I feel it first needs intentionality of leadership to create ecosystems for women who work in our teams to enable them to tide over what I call these double whammy years. The time when you need support, when you have to tend to little children, if you're going to be completely outcome driven, which as professional organizations we should be, but can we create an ecosystem which facilitates that young mom to tide over those difficult years? Similarly, just to complete the thought, when, when, when I say double whammies, as you reach your mid 40s, early 50s, you start having challenges of elder care. Daritri is nodding at me. Many of us are dealing with that elder parents, other elders at home. And that again becomes a time when the, you know, primary responsibility as uh, I go back to what Shamika says, is somehow rests with the woman of the house. So I will say number one, intentionality of leadership to create an ecosystem which facilitates, doesn't undermine the outcome, but facilitates a work environment. Number two, I think we are moving uh, Cheryl to a gig economy setup. Right, the, uh, and the, the corona has kind of facilitated it. I need to pause you here, though, because this is going to launch a whole other discussion, okay. which I'm ready for and excited about. But I would like to hear what the experience is um, in Russia, for example, 
um, supporting women researchers, innovators through the same uh, double whammy years? How do we also integrate them into the integrate us into the economy? I, I know, for example, in the EU, we have more and more gender action plans that are being funded by the European Union to go into all of our research institutions and actually regulate exactly these kinds of practices that you're talking about. But I'm sure in all women environments and in mixed environments, you must have some great experiences to share. Um, yes, there are many cases. Uh, I think in each country, uh, one of the most um, severe obstacle is that we have um, stereotypes in educational sector. And I faced it, and I think all of us faced it. Uh, and even if you are not in STEM, but in some other sphere, like me in international relations, I was told that you will not become a diplomat. And <laughs> the person who told me that was a female professor. And uh, I never wanted to be a diplomat, but still uh, there, there was al always a resistance uh, in the university. If you want to uh, become a successful young woman, you have to um, have double uh, efforts and uh, you should always uh, <laughs> believe only in yourself. Um, as for researchers, as you said, there are many programs like in Russia, we try to catch uh, young women in the university and try to involve them in STEM sciences and uh, we organize special uh, open like doors days for those women and I think it's a nice practice and um, we organize some programs where uh, we, which encourage uh, young women to stay because there is a problem that uh, after like seven or ten years uh, women lose interest to STEM and um, they need to understand that they have, they still have some uh, future, they still have some potential in their careers, so there should be some support in this regard. But I think, um, Dr. Vasudevan, you've seen this, so looking from the labor perspective, of course, um, you know, if, if we can get uh, women out of those research institutions into STEM roles, I would like to maybe um, turn the tables a bit. What is the role of the private sector here? Because clearly the demand for the skilled laborers comes from employers, even the public sector. Um, also, the know-how, right? These are machines, These are this is software. These are things that we are expecting our employees to be able to use. Are there initiatives that are tar targeting the gender gap? in these areas that you've seen? What do you see as kind of incumbent upon the private sector to also lead some of these questions, perhaps? Unfortunately, I won't talk on the STEM because that's not an area I understand. But um, let me give you practical examples of uh, problems that we face. For example, the manufacturing sector. Uh, is a place, in my opinion, women can easily uh, occupy shop floors. But the biggest problem often is is actually not education as much as housing. Uh, warehouses, India's, uh, the logistic sector is booming in India. But uh, wherever warehouses are there, there's no housing. So I'll just give you a statistics. If a woman, uh, you have to pay 3,300 rupees for a shared accommodation. For a man, it's 2,500. So you have an 800 rupee difference because nobody will rent an accommodation to a woman. So there are such practical issues. So in my opinion, if you have to femi feminize workspaces, uh, there is an issue of mobility, security. You should do it where there is maximum chance of success. And where is the maximum chance of success? Where the shop floor, I'm using the shop floor loosely, where the large number of women can be workers. So if we look at that as a place, uh, the difference could be 6% in each industrial sector. So if that is the kind of change one can make, then I think uh, a state policy which incentivizes through tax breaks and other things, two companies could possibly uh, change that. 
I'll just make one more comment, which means the pass through is important, right? When you're ma when you're going to look at manufacturing, then what are your diploma? How many women are in diploma matters? And many of these shop floors are young. By definition, they will be less than 25, 30. So in that case, there is no di distinction. Your age of marriage can actually get postponed by a few years. So at least in your youth, in your young, you can bring women into workforce. If one was focused on manufacturing industrial estates, and I think I could be wrong, but I think there are 3,000 plus industrial estates. And if I add warehouses which are coming in, that could be another 2,000 in the country. So 5,000 concrete things could result in close to 20 million jobs, which could be completely feminized. Wow. This is a recommendation we need to take to the G20. For me, yeah, it's working. It's working. Yeah. For me, I'm a performing education honestly. So uh, we have got lots of challenges being a performing artist and also an educationalist and also the scholars who are working in performing art field. There are challenges is the first year of his, when our performance is coming, physical uh, equal pay. The male are paid more and the female are paid less. Then the health care and the facilities for the well-being of the female artists are not recommended. Then the pension scheme, because the artist's life is very short. They can perform till 40, 45, 50, but there are no pension schemes as such from the state or from the nation. Another part is the insurance. There is uh, to secure the artist, especially the female artist, against the any mishaps or uh, accidents caused during the work or during the performance are very important need of the time. Also, the job creations. But I must say here that new education policy is going to include the Indian art as one of the subject into the course. And that is going to really create and Prime Minister of uh, India, Narendra Modi ji, has included all 64 art forms into these uh, this um, uh, new education policy so that the many job opportunities will be there for all the artists who are doing masters and PhD in their in the schools, in the colleges, in the performances, and of course we are also looking for the reservation and the special quotas in the in the government job in non government jobs and also in the uh, the the travel in the local uh, uh, local uh, railway travels and also we are looking for the uh, uh, in the uh, uh, flight travels along with that there is a sports quota everywhere but there is no cultural quota which is needed for the jobs and uh, uh, with the, uh, uh, with the, of course, one more, uh, it, there are many of the artists who want to be independent. Independent means they don't want to do a job, but they want to do, do their own startup, but there are no startup funds for this, uh, performing artists or the artists. So I think there, uh, the NGOs and the, and the financial academies or the people should come forward to, start up funding for all these things. I think these are the points for performing artists. Here, here. Um, and I, what's very interesting about what you're sharing is that it is, um, it's kind of the crucible of what a woman goes through, an individual Maximum woman. Maximum women are there, there are 70% women in the performing art. And I feel these are the need of the time. So this is indeed to underscore that we women are in the lesser paid sectors. We take more time out of work to support the care economy. And I think we can say, basically women are subsidizing the global economy through unpaid work. This is fair to say. Um, not earning the same money for the same jobs. And then as you're saying, not getting insurance, but also no retirement. I can I can even share that in Europe, where a retirement is guaranteed, we still have a retirement gap of 40 euro cents on the dollar. So this is really, uh, and I, 
uh, if you look in other countries of the world, even more modern, the situation is often worse because at least in some countries we have a certain social ideal, right, to support care, to support retirement. And kind of looking at that later age bracket, I would like to maybe inquire about, yes, switching careers, in, uh, um, lifelong learning. Um, I imagine that there are a lot of women who take up these opportunities. Um, and not to shame us into that, because we also tend to feel we need more skills before we do something. Um, but if you can please share, what do you see in terms of the opportunities for more mature women re-entering the workforce once you've had your children? Uh, what kind of support is there? What do you see it in the numbers of your students or you know, how that kind of fills out in the population? Yeah, this is, uh, this is an evolving situation as we speak. Uh, I was referring earlier to how the uh, pandemic has accelerated uh, what we are living in today, a gig economy, anytime, anyhow, anywhere, work, uh, making work more flexible uh, and more commonplace to be flexible. You know, um, when I, I was in a multinational bank before, and that time, if you went home at six o'clock, they would call you a turkey. But if you went home at nine o'clock, then you were a tiger. So those uh, those connotations associated with, you know, uh, completely immersing yourself in a set pattern of working for 12 hours, I think all of that is changing, which is what is making it more conducive for women to, uh, to to work. In fact, if you look at some of the data during the pandemic, on the one side, so many women came out of the workforce in terms of quitting jobs because of pure burnout, you know, unable to deal with working at home, children at home, schooling at home, everything at home. But at the same time, there is a huge surge in women-led startup enterprises. So I see that the trend in women um, reinventing themselves uh, by 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 going back to a passion uh, starting something new teaming up multi-generational team ups uh, we run an incubator in shishi university we have in the last three years incubated about 120 startups and uh, about 25 percent of them are by women i would like them to be more but uh, at least i mean it's a good number and most of them are uh, you know many of them are multi-generational co-founders and that's a very good sign so it's a mother daughter mother-in-law daughter-in-law whatever combination elder aunt niece whatever it is friends so that is one trend and the second trend you mentioned lifelong learning and that today, uh, going back to my earlier point, is a necessity, not just a good thing to do, but I think it is an important necessary thing for us to do. I think um, there is no taboo associated with it. We run programs uh, where scholars, PhD scholars, are in their 60s or 70s. Uh, we have a post-grad programs and uh, the reference was made to the national education policy, which has made everything so flexible in India that uh, I have a postgraduate graduate program in yoga where uh, our eldest student is a 73 year old gentleman who is studying a two years master's program uh, an, another lady who is uh, 69 years old so our youngest student is 17 and the oldest is 73 all in one campus and coexisting and learning and you know growing together so i see that as a trend uh, around education not just in india but around the world and the pandemic accelerated it by really opening our mind to the possibility of everything being possible virtually. Wonderful. Uh, yes, I have to uh, say one thing is uh, one of the very beautiful, I have also got uh, students uh, after marriage, they come 25, 30, they come back to the uh, master degree or a PhD degree. One of the uh, very, uh, very good initiative by our prime minister, uh, he has said that there should be a global trend of on-the-job learning. Yes. So on-the-job learning is Atma Nirbhar Bharat, which is uh, provided uh, outside the classroom exposure, and that is really creating a very big zoom in the in the married 
so-called married uh, women who wants to join and wants to earn also. So for them, it's a very nice uh, opportunity on the job learning. And also in the NEP, in their new education policy, there is a gender in inclusion fund. There is a in gender inclusion fund. It's, it's the fund to provide quality and equitable education for all the girls and the women. Yes. yes. I would like to re-import this best practice to Europe, where for some time I have actually been campaigning for IT apprenticeships for mature women, right? Because we go through that, that cycle, uh, we come back to the workforce very eager, but we cannot afford not to bring home money. So it has to be a form of on-the-job training because you're still supporting your children. You're still con con contributing to the family, but of course you want to learn. And this is one of the other things I see with um, entrepreneurship in a, lo a large part of Europe, actually. Entrepreneurship is the only way because of discrimination, because of a lack of other opportunities, um, migrant people, uh, we stood up as women out of economic necessity. This is a very important thing to keep in mind. And how can we match um, the you know entrepreneurial skills, um, STEM skills, especially if we have young people and young women in particular, women of all ages, entering the market who might not have job opportunities, and they turn to entrepreneurship. Have you experienced this in your part of the world? What, please share with us, Ksenia. Um, in Russia, everything is organized around the uh, Eurasian Women's Forum, and I think uh, some of you already uh, visited Russia and uh, been to been involved into these activities, and uh, we organize uh, more than 20 projects uh, for different groups of women, and uh, both for young and uh, for um, mature women. Uh, let me give you some examples. Like one is uh, Women Leader, uh, which is aimed at um, uh, improving managerial competences, and um, during this project, uh, women. Uh, teach how to um, organize a social project and uh, it leads to the forming of, of special competences that also helps in uh, entrepreneurship later and also to raising uh, the participation of women in the economy later. Also, um, Russia is, um, the is the initiator of APEC Best Award we like to talk about contests, and uh, it involves more than 20 economies in the Asia Pacific. And I think this is also a, a good practice uh, to encourage women to promote their businesses, to improve their skills, because you not only interact with your counterparts from different parts of the world, but you also learn a lot. So thank you. Well, I think our, our time is winding down, so I want to also stay on point. But I would like, Dr. Patsudeva, if you'd like to add on this point, or my final question was actually the call to action. So what specifically do we want to ask the G20 on the topic of education, skills for women, best practices that you have seen that you say this deserves replicating and scaling even at a global level. I think it's an opportunity for us to take some best practices from India. So I think uh, startup funds have been very useful, but let's get, hold it close. So I think startup funds have been good in India. I think that needs replication, but India also needs growth funds. So women-oriented growth funds still don't exist. Second, I think, is for the, uh, if we look at the, uh, the poor, most self-employed women, which is what you said, out of necessity who become entrepreneurs, it is mostly debt-driven. So there are, <coughs> there are loan schemes. I think there is a need for outcome-bound or, or newer forms of guarantees, like first loss default guarantees, credit guarantees, which are offered for medium companies, but not for small. So um, 
debt in my opinion is the worst way to start a business and grow a business but the poor obvious uh, uh, have more debt than they have uh, access to equity <coughs> last point i'd like to make is um, is not related to this panel but the previous panel is the is the digital access digital access in my mind cannot be taught like financial literacy cannot be taught it needs to be practiced which means they need to be in situations where it is continuously practiced right which means there should be an economic activity out of it um, and I, i'd like to call out one which i think is a huge opportunity for all of us in the world is the way in which the new ai is picking up language so if these are actually given as work to the global south and i'd quote one of the work that we are doing we're just recording uh, languages two people talking in assamese bengali uh, marathi tamil uh, malayalam etc to look at what is the gender which is being used so that the machine doesn't pick up the wrong gender this is work we get paid for it so if we want to stop this is our opportunity to use artificial intelligence to benefit gender so i'd ask the w20 and the g20 to see how do you change the notion of any language um, and therefore the machine will actually say what we do because of pattern recognition um my recommendation is to um uh, just to support the initiative that has been suggested last year during the Indonesian presidency is the monitoring process and i'm really fond of it and we should not do any kind of rankings uh we should do a transparent um framework which will allow all the countries to report on the situation in each country with the gender uh indicators we will see the clear picture what what of what is going on and um we should all take part in it um so this is my first and most bold recommendation and um second is uh, to um promote women researchers and uh, special like maybe g20 initiatives for that uh that would be um that will be will really demanded in um, G20 countries and beyond thank you. i will say specifically to increasing the and continuing women in the workforce or in business uh, some points gayatri ji has already spoken but two things which i have observed myself uh, really uh, elongates the time one is networks and second is mentoring if w20 can create this platform and continue it into active networks for peer to peer learning for business interaction for success transfer of learnings for just being available to each other uh, to uh, to connect with each other i think that will be a huge um, you know a uh, huge way to continue what we have started here and second is mentoring whether it is uh, whether it is professionally employed women whether it is women who have their own enterprises when they have continuous active mentoring they are able to you know pull through or jump over those little roadblocks and i think uh, we can be very good mentors to each other each one of us needs a mentor no matter what stage or uh, age of our uh, professional and personal life we are so networks and mentoring i feel uh, globally uh, skill exchange there should be a policy for a skill exchange program at the global level uh, because there are so many educational exchange programs but there are no skill exchange programs which needs to be there this is what i feel in a recommendation thank you i see that we are at time and i would like to thank our amazing timely and on point on message colleagues our hosts once again and i'd like us all maybe to stand up and repeat what our savitri bai said what savitri bai phule said and that all together is go so get educated that is
let me make sure. What did I say? Go and educate. Go and educate. Ready? One, two, three. Go and educate. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for this very engaging discussion. Um, we